An Introduction to Dialectics by Theodore Adorno, Lecture 12, July 3rd, 1958. Ladies and gentlemen, in the last session I had begun to say something about the relationship between dialectic and positivism, and indeed specifically from the perspective of the double contrast between dialectic on the one hand and any philosophies which appeal to some first ground or principle on the other. And in this connection with a certain interpretive violence of which I am well aware, one may also regard positivism as belonging among such philosophies, insofar as positivism of every sort finds its absolutely first principle in the data provided by experience, whether in those of, uh, <clears throat> whether in those of consciousness or in so-called protocol sentences. However, I feel duty bound here to say at least that such an identification of positivism with the philosophy of origins is not entirely correct. Or to put this more broadly, the identification of empiricism with any metaphysics in the usual sense is not entirely just. For while it is quite true that a certain first principle is indeed assumed in this context, namely the principle of just such a givenness, the principle is not specified in substantive terms. Thus, where the ontological and, in a narrower sense, idealist or rationalist philosophies also believe they can positively specify the first ground or principle, whether it be as spirit, consciousness, transcendental synthesis, being, or whatever the ground or principle in question may be called, the positivist and empiricist positions do indeed claim that the given or the facts provide their ultimate point of reference as far as all genuine knowledge is concerned. It lies in the nature of the case here that the concept of such facticity itself does not specify or anticipate its own determinate character. For it is a mere general concept which can in the event be specified in terms of different or changing content as the case may be. And this also explains why positivistic forms of thought cannot actually be identified directly with what I call a philosophy of origins, and indeed why, in the context of the contemporary debate, these forms of thought regard themselves as emphatically opposed to the ontological tendencies of the present time. You might say that it would seem rather absurd and far-fetched if I now attempted to indicate, and even with some precision, the position of dialectic in relation to positivism, for it is surely quite obvious that dialectic is anti-positivist in character, and that it was the entire positivist trend of Western philosophy, as this has spread through Europe, or throughout Europe, since the death of Hegel, which specifically brought speculative dialectical thought itself to an end, at least from a historical point of view. And I would not contest this claim, Yet the relationship between dialectic and positivism is actually by no means as straightforward as such reflections suggest. If I may remind you for a moment that the problem of dialectic from one point of view is not that of starting from some preconceived totality, but rather to explore the windowless power of the whole, to borrow an expression from an older form of speculative metaphysics at work within the individual givens of experience in each case, and it is precisely in this lack of any pre-given or entirely conclusive highest concept that there is actually an inner affinity between dialectic and positivism, and indeed I have often found in my own work, when I have drawn the appropriate conclusions from these reflections and approached individual phenomena in a micrological way, as I have already expressed it, without bringing them under their higher or generic concept in advance, that I am reproached as follows. While there is basically no difference at all between positivism and what you are doing here, and there are some grey areas here which have also been reflected historically in certain strands of dialectical thought which I would not exactly describe as positivistic, but which nonetheless involve a certain tendency towards sceptical relativism something which is indeed deeply related to positivism, as you may see particularly clearly from the Anglo-Hegelian school in the case of that extraordinarily significant dialectical thinker, Francis Bradley. 
and I gladly take this opportunity to draw your attention to the two great works of Bradley, his appearance in reality and his logic, which in a, special, in a specifically speculative and philosophical sense are probably the most radical and original contributions to the theory of dialectic, which have been made since Hegel. These works offer extraordinarily subtle and difficult investigations which demand considerable attention and patience, but I can assure you that the substantive wealth of these reflections amply rewards such patience. But to return specifically to the relationship between dialectic and positivism, I would remind you above all, since we are concerned with substantive issues here, that in a certain sense dialectic is precisely what the movement of phenomenology perhaps unjustifiably claimed to be, an attitude other than the natural attitude, an attitude which already approaches everything which is regarded as a given, as a fact, with a certain skepticism, an attitude which tends to seek out the hidden powers of the whole behind what appears to us, behind what we encounter as given. The distinction between essence and appearance is indeed utterly constitutive for dialectical thought itself, as we can already see from the way that concepts come to move only by entering into a process of reflection. That is to say, this reflection brings out in the concepts themselves a substance, as it were, which was not actually intended in and indeed was concealed in their merely initial appearance, in their apparent or surface meaning. And if I often speak in these sessions about the different forms of resistance to dialectic, and try and make you specifically aware of them in order to facilitate your access to dialectical thought, I believe we are dealing with a particularly widespread form of resistance at this very point. This is the suspicion that attaches to dialectic of being all too clever, of being a kind of secret wisdom, the suspicion that we are simply never satisfied with what is actually and specifically given to us, and the suspicion above all that the objective moment of dialectic would actually deprive human beings of everything that they subjectively believe about themselves, everything that they take to be their real interest and concern. Now, dialectic does indeed involve this moment, and it would also certainly be a serious mistake to deny this, and thus render dialectic innocuous. But if for quite different reasons, for reasons that are grounded in social experience, we have once come to see that the world in which we live effectively weaves its veil not through any particular lies and intrigues, but by through its own imminent law-like character and repeatedly generates appearances which contradict what this world actually is, then we shall generally come to share this mistrust. Then we shall no longer be able simply to accept the given, the positive, which is presented to us above all by the special sciences as the ultimate legitimate source of certainty no longer able to accept it precisely in the way it is presented here. This very capacity to doubt what is given to us appears increasingly under the tremendous pressure of the givens within which we exist today to be slipping away from human beings. And if we can speak of a certain transference or extension of ego weakness into the process of thinking itself, then I would see this precisely here where human beings capitulate before the so-called givens without displaying that very mistrust, which from the perspective of conventional consciousness, of the mere acceptance of the world as it initially presents itself, cannot fail to create the impression of something artificial and all too clever, which does violence to the way things are. I believe that it is far more appropriate to concede this, far more appropriate to claim that in an entirely alienated world, a world that exists entirely rather than entirely thesi rather than fusi. <laughs> what we need is precisely this arguably unnatural exertion on the part of consciousness. If we are to break through the surface of second nature, then it would be to try and introduce dialectic simply as a kind of sound common sense. Of course, dialectic does have a good deal to do with sound common sense and the steps it takes in each individual case are always steps guided by rational reflection. As I have already attempted to show you, it is not as if there were another kind of source of reason, a speculative source, which would itself be separated by a gulf from the merely reflective rationality of the understanding. 
But on the other hand, I emphatically believe that the dialectical mode of thinking is distinguished from the ordinary use of the understanding precisely because it refuses to be satisfied with the givenness we have described, because it properly begins its work exactly there where the given confronts us most inexorably, where dialectical thought attempts to penetrate what is opaque and seemingly Im impenetrable and to bring all this into movement. And if I were not afraid that some of the natural scientists among you will tell me that scientific analogies from the mouth of a philosopher of dialectical persuasion always have something fatefully problematic about them, then I would say that dialectical thought is always involved in something like an intellectual version of atomic fission. Although I would certainly not claim anything like the celebrated status of the modern natural sciences for the efforts and exertions of dialectic, which as we know has no such brilliant result to, su to show as the creation of the atomic bomb. I said to you that the specific position of dialectic in relation to positivism already lies in the way that the givens which furnish the ultimate point of reference for the positivist view and which standard positivist epistemology typically describes as the immediately given are recognized for their part as something which is mediated. In other words, dialectical thought shows that the ultimate point of reference to which our claim to knowledge appeals as a solid and secure possession is not an ultimate point at all, but something that generally presupposes in turn what it purports to produce from itself. I have tried to develop this thought in a very emphatic fashion in the third chapter of my Meta-Critique of Epistemology, and would draw your attention to that discussion here. For there, you would find a detailed attempt to show that, through their interconnection, the particular categories of what is called the theory of knowledge, which are supposed to constitute the object world, the objective world, in the first place, as this is understood by the traditional epistemological projects. For their part, presuppose that same objective world, namely existence in space and time, just as no existence in space and time can be thought in turn without those categories. I cannot present these developed dialectical reflections properly in the context of these short introductory lectures, but instead of that, I think at least I owe you one or two specific indications of what I mean here in terms of the argument between dialectical and positivist thought. And since the content of dialectic, both in Hegel's phenomenology and in the work of Marx, is indeed essentially a social content, and since I know that many of you are particularly interested in questions of social science, I believe it is particularly fitting if I must take some examples from this domain. Forgive me if I give examples here, for I know I should not really do so, but it's a hard life being a dialectician, and specifically from the positivistic side of the social sciences and in part from what is known as empirical social research, insofar as this aims to gather information about the opinions and forms of behavior of individuals and even of statistically defined social groups. Thus, in an investigation into the community of Darmstadt, for which I was responsible in the later stages of the inquiry, it emerged that a substantial proportion of the population harbor a specifically hostile attitude to the municipal authorities of the city, and it turned out that extraordinarily negative judgments were routinely expressed with regard to municipal officials and employees. In this connection, one would initially be driven to think about specific experiences which people have had in relation to the municipal authorities in this sort of city. And in the context of any rather purblind investigation, that is to say, one which has still to be enlightened about itself, and the significance of dialectic for empirical social research, it seems to me is essentially that of casting some kind of light on otherwise purblind approaches. One would just have said, well then, in Darmstadt, that's how it is. It's an old official sort of place and an old administrative center. The people here have had a good deal of contact with bureaucracy and have a lot of negative experiences in the process and this is expressed in the rather hostile attitudes which we have discovered. But a, but a dialectical thinker would not be satisfied with this illuminating thesis at such a point, for here he would at least ask whether this negative attitude of the population towards the public, employees in a particular city or area, is actually derived from specific experiences and specific factors connected with the place in question.
Um, that is, he will raise the question whether we are not rather dealing here with what American sociologists would describe in terms of generalized attitudes, nam namely with the way that people may already bring such a negative attitude to bureaucracy in general, and then apply this generalized perspective in their judgments concerning public employees, namely the judgments which had been identified in our particular empirical study. Perhaps I can tell you here about the somewhat remarkable way in which I came to entertain this kind of suspicion, for this may also reveal something to you about how the relation between empirical, social approaches, and dialectical considerations actually works. I am very familiar with a particular work which deals with a completely different area, a study in the sociology of literature which is concerned with a novelist who is not in fact German. The author of the study showed that in the novel principally under discussion, we find that a specific opposition within the petit bourgeois world is at least suggested here, even if it is not developed in expressly theoretical or sociological terms, namely a certain antagonism between lower and middle ranking public employees and somewhat freer, more independent individuals who did not receive anything resembling a regular salary. In the eyes, in the eyes of those who have a somewhat freer and more independent existence, small innkeepers or artisans, for example, the official frequently appear the officials frequently appear as parasites who do not have to exert themselves nearly as much as they themselves do, and who can also look forward to the security of a pension at the end of a not especially laborious day or life. In the eyes of the officials, on the other hand, those who have a freer existence on account of the greater earnings they could potentially make appear as a distinctly enviable group in several material respects, and also as one that is not merely, nearly as accustomed to the virtues of order and reliability as they themselves are. I remembered all this in connection with that other study, and so I found myself asking whether this imminent position or imminent opposition between two groups, namely the public employees and everyone else within the middle and lower middle class, might not also find significant expression in people's attitudes, precisely in an area where the group of such employees was in relative terms rather large. And the conclusion which I drew from all this was that I directed the investigation, or rather attempted to redirect it, by ensuring it also included a question or a complex, complex of questions, which could determine firstly whether the people under discussion who would express negative judgments about public employees in the city at issue had in fact come into any significant contact with these employees. And secondly, whether they had specifically negative experiences if and when they did so. Now, where such techniques of empirical social research are concerned, we do not ask an abstract question like, have you had negative experiences? But we inquire after specific negative experiences, for it is only when such specific reports are available that we can check on whether anything is really behind it. I am proud to say that in this case, things actually turned out as I had anticipated, for there was a complete discrepancy between the negative judgments about public employees and the actual experiences involving such employees. In other words, we were dealing here with an externally motivated ideology, and indeed I might add, one which involves society as a whole. For this is a sort of opinion which somehow hangs in the atmosphere of society as a whole, which people in certain numerically significant groups absorb, and which affects the experiences which they have. In other words, the givens which we encounter here, in this case the negative attitudes about public employees, which, are, which a purely positivistic sociology would simply register, analyze, and interpret, are revealed once again to be a function of an entire social process, or that what is individual, particularly in concrete, actually shows itself as dependent upon the totality. And of course this general mood or attitude towards state employees would not exist, if it were not built up from numerous individual cases of such hostility. There is a kind of interaction in play here. Another example 
may help to show you the outstanding social theoretical significance which attaches to what is known as motivational analysis in the field of empirical sociology. For it is only through motivational analysis, that is, by discovering the motivating ground for such negative judgments, that we can even begin to break through the context of delusion surrounding the merely given. I may refer here to another investigation, one conducted in the context of industrial sociology, where we came across a particular kind of hostility on the part of workers who were employed in a specific industrial plant. In considering the investigation of merely subjective opinions, that is, in examining the information concerning the merely subjective data of the hostility, we did not stop there, but also simultaneously examine the objective data directly connected with the industrial plant itself. And it emerged that the workers' superiors within the plant acted in an uncommonly reasonable, humane, and sympathetic way in the context of the general situation. But it also emerged that, for quite specific reasons, the overall organization of the plant, which was somewhat old-fashioned, exerted continual pressure on the workers. And it turned out, to put the matter briefly, that the superiors or the people towards whom the workers in question had reacted with hostility were simply character masks, to use a Marxian expression, and that the hostility had nothing to do with the actual people themselves. Thus, if the workers developed a certain hostility to these people, this was because they had thereby simply transferred an objective relation. The structural relation with their superiors along with the specific relations of production operative within the business. To these individuals, although these individuals themselves were only masks of the functions they performed. What we are dealing with here is a process of extraordinarily far-reaching significance to which I wished at least to draw your attention en passant, namely the process of personalization. And some insight into concrete dialectical operations here may help you to avoid falling victim to this mechanism of personalization yourselves. What is meant by personaliz personalization in this context is simply this. The greater the power of objective relations becomes, and above all, the more anonymous the relations of power and pressure in which we are caught up become, the more this alien and anonymous character itself becomes unbearable. As a result, if we fail to reflect closely upon these things, we experience an even stronger tendency to project what in reality is due to such objective circumstances precisely upon personal factors, upon the characteristics of particular human beings, or particular groups of human beings. And here I would voice the thought that the racist delusions of National Socialism was able to exercise the extraordinary influence that it actually did, only because it responded to precisely this need. That is, because it burdened specific vulnerable human beings and vulnerable human groups with responsibility for sufferings and misfortunes, which in reality were anonymous in character and utterly unbearable for that reason. From the psychodynamic perspective, this process also processes a number of other advantages, or possesses a number of other advantages. For it is much easier to project one's own aggressive affects upon specific persons than is the case with more objective or material relations. But if we naively rest content with registering what pe rest content with registering what people in general happen to think, then we ourselves fall victim to that delusive mechanism of personalization, which I have attempted, at least in outline, to describe for you in my preceding observations. Oh, okay. I may also mention, as a third example, something which I already encountered in America from when I intervened in just this sense by introducing dialectical considerations into the supposedly spontaneous running of the sciences. I certainly had my difficulties, even if I also enjoyed some modest triumphs. Thus, I challenged the notion that people took pleasure in particular hit songs specifically on account of the songs themselves. And when I considered the particular preferences and rejections which were identified here, or the relevant likes and dislikes, as they are called in the jargon of American communication research, and attempted to relate them to the objective givens, 
it turned out that the songs people like most are the ones that are played the most and with which they are most familiar, with the songs with which they are not familiar and which they do not hear so frequently are generally rejected by them. And when we ask in turn why these particular songs are played so frequently, we also discover that certain subjective qualities and preferences are involved here. What you find in this connection is an extraordinarily co complex system of reciprocal relations, which is rather the opposite of the straightforward or immediate givens with which so-called opinion research is generally concerned. For opinion research is indeed usually interested in discovering, for administrative or commercial reasons, what people are for or against, as the case may be. And if we simply stop here with this for and against, then we only help to weave that veil around the so-called givens of which I spoke to you at the beginning. The positivistic social scientists among you will probably object at this point that all of the thoughts I have developed for you here are for their part entirely compatible with positivism, and that I could have presented these same thoughts in investigations which would have to be conducted along more or less positivistic lines if they were to prove conclusive. Now I, now I would not actually deny this, and would like to repeat here that dialectical thought is precisely not a kind of intu intuitionism, is not some form of thinking that is entirely different in character or kind from the thinking which is ordinarily practiced in the logic of the sciences. It is simply that dialectical thought, in contrast to such thinking, is expressly self-reflective in character. In other words, dialectical thought is thought that sheds light on itself, as I put this earlier, rather than proceeding in a rigid and purblind fashion. In other words, I do believe that the transition to dialectical thought is necessarily implicit in every so-called positivistic investigation that is internally consistent and truly self-aware, just as we discovered in our recent seminars on sociology that a sociologist such as Weber, who saw himself at least as entirely positivist in orientation, found himself driven to certain dialectical formulations under the impact of the data which he himself undertook to explore and develop. Even though these formulations were quite incompatible with his own position regarding the theory of scientific knowledge, incompatible with his own philosophy, so to speak. But I don't wish to stop here with this all too convenient point. For above all, I want to remind you and bring home to you that when, in the investigations I have mentioned, we keep referring back to the social whole or society in its entirety in relation to a more tangible, determinate, and specific social fields. We are dealing here with something other than a mere hypothesis. The reason for this is simple. In the case of a hypothesis, it must be possible for you to test the principal content by recourse to some experimentum crucis, so that you can in turn convert this hypothesis itself into a kind of scientific given. But in all of the examples I have provided for you here, this is certainly not the case. For society as a whole, or even the prevailing ideology as a whole, that which lies in the general atmosphere, as it were, that which brings human beings into a certain decisive relationship to public employees, to their superiors, to hit songs, as the case may be. This is something that you cannot actually grasp in the same way that you grasp the individual and specific attitudes to, the, to these phenomena, attitudes which you can only you can not only identify empirically, but which you can ever even measure and quantify as such. In other words, what theory, what the knowledge of society as a whole which precedes such an empirical investigation, investigation brings to this sort of investigation is indeed a certain power which sets the results of such an investigation into inter internal motion. Yet it is not itself a given, like the givens which are themselves discovered in the process. Rather, it is more like a center of forces, which for its own part largely eludes the precise and unambiguous mechanisms of verification and falsification. One must also add that the significance of this recourse to the general structures of society, or the ideologies of society as a whole, or whatever it may be, certainly does not lie in the idea of simply opposing some further particular instance of knowledge 
to those particular instances of knowledge that we have already criticized in this connection. On the contrary, the point is just to grasp the, and describe the social tendency within which these particular instances of knowledge can be grasped for their own part. Such a procedure, therefore, cannot for its part simply be redeemed here and now, for indeed its essential intention is not to be redeemed through observational data, through the firm and reliable declaration. Yes, now we have it, this is society as a whole. Rather, its significance is solely that of grasping the factual data themselves and their movement, even though this would precisely contradict the positivist conception of the formation of hypotheses. You may say in reply, how then do you actually operate with such concepts, and what is the path which justifies you in using them, assuming that you wish to avoid falling into merely arbitrary conjecture or into a kind of airy speculation? And here, precisely, I think I have another opportunity to show you in an extremely, intangi in, in extremely tangible and striking way what I have tried to describe for you in very general philosophical terms with the concept of negativity or contradiction. For the path which leads us to these reflections is a twofold one. In the first place, I must, in a sense, already bring something with me from without. Thus, I believe that it is an essential part of any dialectical thinking to be a thinking which is always both within its ob object and also outside of its object, for the movement which we perceive in the object also always presupposes some knowledge of what transpires outside of the object in question, that is, some knowledge of the wider context and connections in which the object itself stands. If I do not recognize that we live in a society in which, for example, the relation to one's superiors in the context of work has a determinate objective structure and involves a determinate aspect of perpetual pressure, which already shapes in advance every personal relationship, then of course I will never even come across the thought that one's superior is to some extent a character mask of the function which he or she has to perform. But secondly, on the other hand, the path which actually leads me to set the merely empirical observations into dialectical motion is none other than that through which the individual givens that I have before me turn out to be contradictory or problematic within themselves. To formulate this in a very blunt and thus rather primitive and inadequate manner, in the first place there is a contradiction between the remarks of those who were questioned in the Demartstadt investigation. I regard all public employees as idle, as a bureaucracy which fails to take our pressing needs seriously. And the fact that the people who spoke in this way either had had no particularly bad experiences with public employees or had actually had no experience with them at all. This contradiction which I here encountered in the so-called given itself thus compels me to go beyond the given and to introduce something more comprehensive and universal in its place. In this connection you will have not noticed that in this very example and in a number of others I have certainly spoken of society as a whole, yet you will always have noticed that the kinds of substantiation I have offered you in this regard are by no means as abstractly all-embracing as the concept of society as a whole implies. This means that I am driven here to adopt the perspective of an imminent contradiction between the public employees on the one hand and independent forms of social existence in specific social strata on the other, something which itself then finds expression in that contradiction between experience and opinion, and it would then be another further and much more complicated step, step which would go far beyond the rudimentary reflections which I introduced earlier if we were to proceed from here on the basis of this contradiction to address questions concerning the structure of society as a whole, or to go further the path which has brought us to regard the tensions within, within a particular industrial plant not as something conditioned by personal factors, but as something which is conditioned, on the one side, by the objective relation to superiors in the particular plant, and on the other, by specific conditions of production, which determine that relation in the plant in question. This path is actually none other than this. That the contradiction between the judgment of the respondents regarding the supposed unfriendliness or maliciousness of their superiors, and the objective insight into the actual character of these human beings, 
and of the process of production itself, is what has brought us to qualify those supposedly ultimate givens which we first encountered when we simply questioned the respondents of the course of our investigation. All this, of course, is in a profound sense pre-philosophical, or is not dialectical in the radical sense, for the path and progress of dialectic consists precisely in challenging every concept of facticity, of immediate givenness, of particular observational data, such as I have just used here. But since indeed we have interpreted dialectic not as some heteronomous form or structure which is simply contrasted with science as such, but rather as science which has been raised to its own self-consciousness, it was perhaps still useful to show you how particular scientific work is driven by its own imminent dynamic to approach the perspective of dialectic and thereby to clarify for you the difference between positivism and dialectic.